All right, welcome back everyone to Foundations of Business. I hope you're doing well. Uh, today, we're gonna do a, uh, a uh, reflect and recap of um, the information and the material for exam two. So chapters six through 12, with the exceptions of nine and 11, um, and this will help prepare you for exam two, which is coming up. And so let me, uh, let me pull up and share my screen so that we can uh, walk through, do a crosswalk through uh, this particular review. So very similar to exam one, uh, you'll have 50 minutes. Uh, 50 minutes as always to answer anywhere from 40 to 45 questions, could be multiple choice, fill in the blanks. Um, you'll have that. Um, the exam is open book, but no collaboration with other students is authorized. Remember, this is a comprehensive exam. So it does include material from exam one, so chapters one through five, and then our most recent modules that uh, include chapters six through 12, again, not uh, chapters nine and 11. Uh, no morning brew uh, specific questions are there. Now for summer one session, uh, you actually will have uh, from 6 a.m. until midnight to get your uh, exam finished. Uh, you know, obviously for students in a fall or semester, or spring semester, uh, you would have to be in the classroom during the normal uh, scheduled class time. All right, real quick, let's jump into it. Sole proprietorship. Remember, um, sole proprietorship is one person owns the company. It does account for about 72% of all businesses. There are obviously some advantages to it, complete control for the owner. So Many of you may aspire to be, uh, be your own boss, be an entrepreneur. Um, and so there would certainly be complete control for that owner. Uh, relatively easy and inexpensive to, to form. And then the profits all remain with the owner. Whenever there's advantages, there's probably gonna be some disadvantages. And so some of the disadvantages, certainly complete responsibility for talent and financing. When there's only one person that's in control and the owner, then certainly all of that responsibility rests on his or her shoulders. Unlimited liability. So anything that legally could go wrong uh, could certainly be an issue uh, there. And if for some reason the business owner dies, typically the business dies because uh, there's no succession plan uh, from that stand standpoint. So Freelancers, consultants, independent contractors typically operate as sole proprietors. Um, most of the time, it's just getting some, uh, you know uh, for individuals to go to their local governments and get a license or permit, and uh, it's a pretty simple structure to maintain uh, some some business forms. A partnership, obviously, more than one person. Uh, a, a general partnership is about ten percent of uh, all U.S. businesses, again, uh, jointly by two or more people. Again, advantages, more resources and talents uh, because there's more people involved. Um, certainly, there would be some succession planning and ability to continue the business if, the, uh, if there was a death of a partner. Some disadvantages, we know in working with other humans that disputes can happen and there could be partnership disputes. That, uh, that come with that. Again, unlimited liability. And now that there's more people, then there are shared profits. A limited partnership, again, there's a single general partner who runs the business, kind of like a managing partner, a managing director, um, and they're responsible for liabilities. The other members, the other partners, um, basically their involvement is just in what they have invested. Um, so their losses would only be limited to the amount that they've invested. That would need to be written out, obviously, in a partnership agreement. And these are some of the aspects of a partnership agreement. The big part here is if, if there's disputes, how will they be handled? Um, you know, what's the condition for dissolving the partnership? Roles and responsibilities. Who does what? Um, what's the income distribution look like? Within, a, uh, within the organization. So that's an important part of a partnership agreement. We then move over to corporations. Corporations, many of us know, we're consumers. We see corporations day in and day out. 
Uh, there are shareholders who invest by buying uh, shares of stock. Keep in mind, corporations are governed by a board of directors who are, who are elected by the shareholders. Okay, so a board of directors, which are typically not employees of the organization. Some of the, you know, maybe the chairperson, um, you know, or the, would, would be, or maybe, you know, a director or two. But most of the time, they come from outside the particular company to give some diversity of thought, some expertise. For example, when I was at Newell Rubbermaid, on our board of directors was um, two, two different people that I can recall immediately. One was the chairman of Coca-Cola, the CEO and chairman of Coca-Cola. And we also had the CEO of Whirlpool that was on the Rubbermaid board. So important to, to note the diversity of industries and, and uh, expertise and leadership there. Obviously some advantages, easier access to financing that should make sense since there's, uh, you know, sharing, a, a, you know, the ability to, to gain financing through selling of stock, unlimited life for the corporation. So if, you know, if an if a important leader passes away, the company continues. Limited liability now. So all of a sudden, you know, structurally, there's some uh, limits on legal aspects and, and certainly helps. So the disadvantages size, the agency problem, double taxation, and then expenses and regulations are can be very, very expensive. Remember the definition of the agency problem. You will see that again. Uh, you know, again, that is when the managers and directors of the organizations have to do what's best for the organization. Typically, they will do best what's for them, right? Many times there's there's very high compensation and benefits that are tied to their role. And maybe they're acting what's best for them versus what's best for the company. Okay. Types of businesses, you see the chart here. You've seen it in the textbook. Um, certainly understand that. Mergers and acquisitions. Uh, remember, a merger is when two companies come together, form a new company. An acquisition is the purchase of one, but not a new company. And typically, the company that's being acquired, it either becomes a brand or a division of or it's dissolved um, and it just becomes, you know, through the acquisition. You can see why mergers and acquisitions happen, uh, realizing synergies. So there could be duplication of resources. Two companies come together. Uh, maybe there's 50 accountants. accountants. Do we need 50 accountants? Maybe we can get the work done with 35. Uh, bring the company together. We now have 50 sales and marketing people. Do we need 50 sales and marketing people? Maybe it's 35. With that said, maybe you bring it together and instead of 50 accountants, we now need 60 accountants, right? But the whole point of synergies is the ability to look at what there are similarities to, duplication of resources, and then eliminating that and driving down costs uh, from that aspect. Uh, another reason is to attain new markets or distribution channels. Um, and then to, to also gain complementary uh, products. Now, remember, a hostile takeover is when a company is purchased, um, even though the company's management and board of directors do not want to be acquired. So this can happen. And you say, well, why? How does this still happen? Um, so a hostile takeover, a lot of times there's, there's been some negotiations, things have been happening behind the scenes. Um, the, the company that's, that, you know, is looking to be acquired, they don't want to be. Maybe it's for personal reasons. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe the owner wants to hold on to it as long as possible. So the hostile part goes, we don't want to be taken over. The company that wants to acquire, they will then go to the press and they'll go to the public. Why? Because that's where the shareholders are and the news can go out. And, uh, and so they'll, they'll put together the value proposition, the reasons why. And, um, and a lot of times the shareholders will then put pressure on company management and board of directors to do the right thing, make it right. Entrepreneurship, moving on here. Uh, three characteristics of entrepreneurial activity. Remember innovation, uh, running a business and risk-taking. And innovation is looking at new techniques, new technologies, opening a new market. Uh, maybe it's enhancing a particular product. Uh, Risk-taking, um, you know, is certainly understanding that the entrepreneurial venture can't be known. 
you don't know what you don't know as an entrepreneur. And so in order to take that initiative, make an investment, do some research, spend some money, that takes risk. And not everyone has that. Some various funding sources. And so when you look at uh, crowdfunding, you know, certainly trying to offer um, some tokens of appreciation in, in order to raise money. Could it be anywhere from $5 to $5,000, anywhere in between or above? Um, typically does not mean that you're going to get ownership in the company. Could if the investment's high enough, but typically, for example, you know, you may make a donation for $50 and they say, okay, here's a free pair of sunglasses uh, based on, you know, your investment on us. So uh, angel investors, these are affluent investors who certainly are going to get an equity stake. They're going to get ownership in the company. Um, they're going to invest money, but they also want to invest time um, so that typically they, you know, they have been entrepreneurs themselves. They understand the, the role of mentors and mentees and advisors because they know that the more that, you know, the more advice that's given, the likelihood of success could happen, right? It doesn't mean it's going to happen, but it could certainly increases the probability of success. And so angel investors are, you know, kind of a time and talent uh, along with the treasure that comes through that. Now, venture capital, much, uh, much higher expectations of return because typically they're giving, they're also investing more money. Um, typically venture capital or groups of investors that have come to together, they've created a fund. Um, so you could have anywhere from one to, to several investors that are part of this fund. And because their dollar value investment is much higher, they really want something to happen quickly. Um, so a lot of times their patience is not as um, forgiving as, say, the angel investors. Small business can definitely be strenuous. You can see why businesses fail. So understand these, um, you know, undercapitalization, meaning lack of funding, um, insufficient organization structure. Uh, these are all part of that. Moving on to chapter eight, and we started talking about management and what do managers do? Plan, organize, lead, and control. Polk is where that comes into play. Uh, part of the planning of, for managers and leaders is developing a strategic plan. So know what a vision statement is, know what a mission statement is, be able to apply those um, in that. Understand why we do a SWOT analysis. Um, so again, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Strengths and weaknesses are the internal reflection, the internal audit, the internal review analysis of the organization, where opportunities and threats are looking at the external factors that can happen. Could be economic conditions, laws and regulations, customers' expectations. All of those uh, need to be evaluated uh, from an opportunities and threats. Remember the SWOT analysis along with strategic planning help to define the competitive advantage for the organization. So as part of the strategic planning, it's understanding the competitive analysis so that you can, so that an organization can develop the competitive advantage from there. Leadership styles. I'm not going to go through each and every one of these. Um, you know, I did that in the previous uh, discussion presentation, but be able to understand not only the definition, be able to apply them, but why? Why is, why is being an autocratic manager okay at some times, right? Situational leadership can come into play. Uh, and understand that transformational, you know, is, doesn't always happen. That is not something, it's not like you check a box from free reign to transactional to transformational. It really takes the, the, the mind and the spirit of that leader to want to be transformational, to want to take the time to be able to mentor and guide and coach a subordinate and motivate that subordinate to achieve not only organizational goals, that definition should be organizational goals and personal professional development as well, okay? Controlling, you can see the definition of controlling, again, understanding the goals and objectives, uh, measuring, being able to measure that performance, understand there could be a difference between the 
uh, aspired state to the current state? Why is there a deviation? Determine the reasons for that and then put in some corrective action so that you can get there in the future. So controlling should be done on a frequent, periodic and frequent basis. Um, benchmarking, um, you know, again, comparing the competition to other industry likes, evaluating similar companies. Why do we do this? It's to exchange ideas, improve efficiency, maybe lower cost. Um, this helps you know, with the practice and processes and understanding how to improve uh, both efficiency and effectiveness. Management skills, I'm not gonna go through each and every one of these, but you know, just understand um, how important each one of these are from a management and leadership aspect. Uh, think about your own journey and how you can achieve, you know, how you can acquire each one of these. So for example, interpersonal skills, that's not something we're necessarily born with. I mean, there are some exceptions. People are born just with the gift of gab or, you know, they, they seem to know how to do it, you know. Um, but typically this can be a, the great thing is this can be a learned skill, uh, the relationship skills and being able to motivate other people. So think about your own strengths, your own Clifton strengths and how you can utilize that. Now, interpersonal skills, I like to refer to those as human-centric skills. Um, another term I don't like is soft skills. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of that term. Uh, but these are skills that industry partners, recruiters, are saying that um, many of their candidates lack. They lack interpersonal skills. So this is a great opportunity for you entering the workforce soon is to be able to figure out ways to develop those interpersonal skills. You know, another one, problem solving and being able to make decisions based on um, data and analysis and being able to define a problem. Not everyone can do that as well. And so figure out ways, if, the, if, that, if you think that is a passion and a purpose for you, certainly could differentiate you uh, from that. Operations management, remember there is a transformation process, you know, inputs and outputs. Who manages all of this? Um, you know, the incoming raw materials, the information, the data on the input side, uh, being able to convert that to either goods or services, and then being able to understand the distribution channels, the ways to get it to market is critical. Um, that's what operations managers do. Um, operations management looks at the production planning, production control, quality control. Use the words, use this foundation of planning, organizing, leading, and controlling within the definition and in, within the framework of what operations management does. What do I mean by that? Well, production planning is how will goods be produced? Where will they take place? Because that's what you do in a management planning, right? Where, how, how should things be laid out? Control, again, goes into goals and objectives, but reality, okay? So we started out with this mission of where we wanted to go. Unfortunately, we're not there yet. Why aren't we there yet? And so it's looking at feedback and understanding ways to make adjustments if needed. Monitoring that on a consistent basis uh, is very, very important. Production control methods, I'm not going to walk through these. Um, you know, again, be sure you read the textbook, understand the differences. Uh, mass customization sort of brings make to order and mass production together uh, because you can utilize the tools and resources from mass production in order to have the end. And then if you have the intimacy with the customer, being able to meet their expectations uh, from there. Purchasing and supplier selection, again, part of operations management. It's not always based on the price. There's this total cost um, evaluation that comes into play. And what does that mean? You know, is the quality good? Is the supplier reliable? Um, are they easy to work with? Do they have good payment terms? Um, you know, all of these come into play. Lead time um, can, can be a part of it. So there's a total cost evaluation, not always based on the best price. Um, Site selection, pretty straightforward, I think, pretty intuitive. 
you know, minimizing shipping costs, being close to customers and suppliers or both, looking at where resources have reasonable costs um, or other expenses like land, labor, construction, utilities, making sure that those types of costs are low, uh, looking at financial incentives that can happen from various governments uh, can come into play. Capacity planning kind of brings this entire equation together. Product plus production method plus site selection, looking at the forecast gets us into a capacity requirements. Scheduling is an important management focus on material, service, labor, and funding. All of that comes into play and helps us determine, you know, people, helps us determine processes, helps us determine scheduling, helps us to communicate externally to the customers on when will things be available. So capacity requirements, very, very important for the organization. You're gonna practice this um, at the end of the semester, or excuse me, at the, at the end of the session in your capsum uh, piece. Inventory control kind of gets into uh, reasons for financial and space limitations. And, you know, so just in time is, is that, it's production, bringing materials that arrive just in time to the manufacturing process. A tool resource practice is material requirements, planning, MRP. So it uses sales forecast. What do the customers want? When do they need it? Where do they need it? You know, if you think about Amazon's got distribution centers all over the air, all over the world. Um, you know, the suppliers that supply Amazon, what's that sales forecast? How many at each distribution center? When do they need to be there? By what color? Red, white, blue, what, you know, all of that is material requirements planning, being able to get there. Okay. Um, just some graphical tools, visualization tools. Remember, a Gantt chart helps to determine the status. A PERT chart gives the activities and then gives us the critical path. And remember, the critical path is the sequence of activities that require the greatest amount of time. And so if, there, if we're waiting on something, let's say we've ordered something specific from Germany, and that's going to take eight weeks. Well, that's, that is on the critical path because we can't do anything until that particular piece of equipment or machinery arrives. We cannot move forward until that happens. That's the critical path. Okay. Uh, human resource management, HR. Remember the important role here. Um, and it's changed over time because we, we look at uh, employees as a resource now. There's new laws that are written each and every year. There's various functions and understand these various functions within HR. Um, different types of work arrangements. I think these are pretty straightforward. Certainly uh, telecommuting has taken on a whole new life of its own uh, during COVID. You not only understand the definition of these, but why and where would you use them, I think is another important part to understand about alternative work arrangements. Job rotation, remember, helps companies cross-train employees, gives fresh ideas on other work practices, helps, helps um, employees become more promotion ready. And this can be done, you know, it says here two to three years of employment. That's kind of consistent. You know, it could be six months, but up to that uh, amount of time. But it certainly helps the employees bring new value to the organization. But let's be honest, the company is also getting a benefit as well because now they have cross-trained employees through the job rotation. Compensation and benefits, the key point here is clearly know the difference. Now, unfortunately, about 20% of you are gonna get some of these questions wrong because you're just not, you're not really reading the question on the exam, okay? Be sure to read the question carefully. There's a big difference between piecework and commissions. Do they sound similar? Absolutely, but there's clearly a big difference here uh, between that. One's a percentage based on the total dollar value Piecework is the number of units being able to produce. Read the question carefully, okay? Just some other incentive programs too. Stock options, be able to um, calculate the value of stock options as well. Some other ways to improve employee satisfaction and motivation. 
job enlargement, job enrichment. Remember, job enlargement is just really trying to avoid bo boredom and, and helping motivate uh, through employee satisfaction. So just smaller or similar skills, adding different tasks. Job enrichment really is the manager seeing the, um, the capability and the um, potential of that employee and giving more opportunities. So helps to build self-esteem and recognition, helps them reach their potential. So, you know, very, very different between enlargement and enrichment. Performance appraisals, remember time, time, time. So they should be done on a frequent basis. There should be good communication between the two. It is a written evaluation. Rates the performance. So it could be good or bad. Important to do this because if there is a termination that ha has to happen in the future, these performance appraisals help to build the story, good, bad, or ugly, to get there. And so having that open dialogue and the ability to discuss that evaluation helps to improve performance. But let's also be honest, it helps to build a legal case, potentially, if someone has to be terminated. I would also say on the positive side through performance evaluations can actually help someone get promoted as well. If, as long as they're strong along the way, it helps to do it. 360 degree uh, feedback performance. Just remember, this is an eva a peer evaluation. Um, you know, it helps supervisors, reporting subordinates understand and get feedback from multiple directions. Um, again, especially as teams are used, cross functional teams are used in organizations. You know, you don't see what you don't see. You don't know what you don't see as a manager. And so being able to get this feedback, um, you know, from your subordinates, peers, and the people that they work with on a more regular basis, this helps. Again, preparation for exam two, chapter key takeaways. They're there for a reason. Uh, read them. If there's something in that chapter key takeaway that you don't understand or you don't recognize, Go back and read that part of the chapter again. Learning objectives, again, this is somewhere we typically fly past. We don't look at them. We don't pay attention to them. Understand them. Go back to the learning objectives, one after another and after another. Are you understanding those learning objectives? Um, and if the answer is yes, then move on. If the answer is no, then go to the textbook Go to the discussion presentation, find that concept in the video and learn it. Go through it again. Um, it's an important part. Hopefully you're taking some lecture notes. Those are all there. You have your quiz submissions. You've had several quizzes now uh, that you can use and then certainly you have your notes um, as well. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Uh, certainly I wanna wish you the best um, uh, on exam two, I really want you to do well. Truly, I want you to do well. If you have questions between now and then, feel free to reach out. Definitely here to help in any way possible. With that, take care of yourself and we will see you soon.